Anthony Cummins, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, so you helped put out this book, The True Path of the Ninja. It's a translation of a, a set of Japanese scrolls from the 1600s called the Shoninki. Is that, did I pronounce that right? Yes, pretty much, yep. All right. And it's an authentic ninja training manual. So before I read this book, my conception of ninjas was what I've learned from popular culture here in the United States. Guys in black, using flying nin you know, nin nin ninja stars, ninja turtles, all that stuff. But this gave me a completely different view of ninjas. And what I love about the book, too, is that it's sort of like The Art of War or The Book of Five Rings. It, it gets very specific about you know ninja things, but also has these like overall broad philosophies that you can apply to your life. And we'll get into those, some of those specifics here in a bit. But before we do that, can you give us a bit of historical background on ninjas? When did ninjutsu begin? Why did it begin? Who practiced it? What their role was in feudal Japan? Yeah, no problem. Basically, I had the same. I loved ninjas since a kid. I'm like pretty much one of those really sad guys was obsessed with it. But when I went to Japan to study with these so-called ninjas, I realized it just wasn't right. So I decided to go around and collect as many of the ninja scrolls as possible. So um, basically what we've come to, I was the same. I had this idea of what ninja were, but it's been totally changed. So the first record of the ninja comes in 1375. So there's a there's a document called the Tai Heiki, which just talks about, they called Shinobi originally. In fact, you should say Shinobi no Mono instead of Ninja, but obviously everybody knows Ninja. Um, so basically they start in this document and then they just sort of start appearing in different documents. And the idea is that they're part of the military organization. They're the commando spies of Japan. So when an army was on the move, you would literally take with you your commandos, your spies, your spy networks, and people would just send them out all over Japan and to get them to gather information. I thought one of the, the one of the myths that that you blew up in this book was you know there's this idea like ninjas versus samurai, right? That's like that was the ninja's sworn enemy. But you talk about in the book like ninjas were oftentimes samurai. Like that, like that I thought it was really interesting. This is one of those that no matter how many times I've told people, people just don't seem to be able to get it at the moment. But what you've got is samurai is a social class. So samurai is one of four things you get. Samurai at the top, then you get farmers, then you get um, artisans, craftsmen, and then merchants. Ninja is not a social position. It's a military role. It's a job. So a ninja could be a samurai or he could be a foot soldier. More than likely, they were samurai, though, trained. This idea of the ninja peasant is total myth. In fact, the guy who wrote this is called Natori Masazumi. He's a samurai. In fact, he's a very high-ranking samurai. And nearly 100% of the texts that we have left today are all written by samurai. So basically, this is a, a, a training manual. You could be a samurai, but it was specifically in how to fulfill this role as a spy, basically. Well, the best way to look at it, if you want to look at it from a modern point of view, is you have to go and join the army if you or the military if you want to be a spy or a commando. So you don't just get your random farmer in the field who's never had any training to be your spy. So you would obviously take it from your military class. So obviously you get foot soldiers and then you get samurai who are more officers. So when you go to special forces, ninja are basically special forces. So when you go to your special forces, you'll say, um okay, we need an officer from here because he's well-trained, but they've got this foot soldier here who's a total maniac and will go and murder everyone. So we'll, we'll use him. So that's basically how they did it. Any other myths about ninjas that we have here in the West? Yeah, mainly the hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat is your big one. It started in the 1960s in Japan as a very small thing, and it blew up. It became massive in the 80s and 90s as the ninja hand-to-hand -hand fighting system. It just doesn't exist in history. It's not there. So there isn't like ninjutsu, like you can get your black belt in ninjutsu. That, that is not a real thing. That's not a real thing. That all started, as I say, in the 80s, basically. So it's a bit of a problem because we've got a lot of um, emotional sort of throwback on that because a lot of people spent a lot of time training with these Japanese people and it, to be fair it was just a lot of cashing in on the sort of post Bruce Lee era. Yeah actually I have a book I bought a book and I, I don't have it anymore but I bought it when I was in eighth grade it was like how to be a ninja and it was like this manual and it was really cheesy like the photographs were terrible but there was like these weird moves like how to disappear like a ninja there's like a move like monkey steals the peach which is like you grab your opponent's testicles and like 
I thought it was funny, but at the same time, I thought it was cool when you're in eighth grade. But yeah, after I read True Path of the Ninja, that was, I, I've learned that that was... <laughs> now, this is where a lot of people get it wrong. Ninjas did fight. There's not, there's no doubt about that. But they don't have a specific system that only they use and it's passed down in secret. They use the same fighting methods as everyone else. Okay. All right, gotcha. So if anyone says they are a ninja master and they can teach you ninja martial arts, do not believe them. Do not believe it. If they're wearing a black karate gi, they've got a black belt on and they say they train in the ancient arts of the ninja it was they believe it they're not lying there's no problem there but it was lie they were lied to okay so let's talk about the the shinoki and specifically um big picture what are the the broad themes in the set of scrolls i mean what were the driving principles so if there wasn't ninjutsu martial arts ninjutsu was more of a a way of approaching the world stealthily i guess so what were the big principles behind ninjutsu right so basically an army needs every sort of specialist so you've obviously got your specialists in spearsmanship you've got your cavalry officers and things like that so ninjutsu developed ninjutsu means it's shinobi no jutsu means the skills of the ninja that's all it means. And it's an auxiliary art that goes on the side of all your other training. So you'd go and learn horsemanship, you'd go and learn um, how to create fire, how to fight with a spear, but then you'd need, so you'd pick up the best people for, who would do intelligence. So those who could speak multiple dialects and languages, you can get those who do counter espionage, they will double check for spies coming in. You get propaganda agents. What they'll do is go and spread rumors in other provinces and to try and create a division between the enemy. And then you get classic commando style infiltration. You know, you sort of um, black war paint on and guys going in and they form networks. Yeah. So basically that's, they deal with all of that, including like special weapons and uh, destruction and demolition. Right. So, I mean, there's like, there's books like that here in the modern day. Like you can buy like vintage CIA field manuals for spies pretty much the same thing the good thing about the ninja what makes the ninja so famous and special is the fact that they do a, it's a james bond thing where james bond will be a spy one film or one part of the film and then he's a commando the next part and then he's an assassin the next part and all that seems to be mixed in together and that's very much what the ninja trained in and i love to um getting back to some of the myths of the ninja there's one chapter where natori matazumi he writes about the equipment and the clothing a ninja should have on him and like again like we have that idea like he's in all black he's got the mask he's got ninja stars but that's not how it's described here i mean what was the typical wardrobe a ninja was supposed to wear and what kind of equipment did he keep on him right well uh first of all the the ninja star is not it's not real it, the ninja star does exist but it's not a ninja weapon so uh that came later but basically a ninja would be wearing normal military clothes you've when you see this ninja suit and you've got this image of it you've got to remember that's traditional japanese wear it wasn't out of place there the only thing that's out of place is the hood but even then people wore hoods when they didn't want to go into it or if they didn't want to be seen going into brothels and things like that <laughs> they could wear a mask so basically a ninja would just wear normal clothes of the day but when he infiltrated in trying to find something lightweight and he might he may or may not cover their face. We don't know about that, but probably not. There's a whole sections dedicated to the art of disguise, like how to disguise yourself in different situations as well. Yeah, so you've got two options as a ninja. You can either go in infiltration style, meaning you know no, you shouldn't be seen. You wear dark clothes and you use magical spells to hide yourself and all that. But on the other hand, you've got to go into enemy territory, walking, outwardly walking. So you've got to blend in with the crowd. So say you need to be a priest or an acrobat or just wear clothes that the people of the other place wear. So make sure you've got the same hairstyle as the that province or make sure you're not wearing clothes that seem strange in that province. So you've got to do your research beforehand. I think they did the same in World War II, didn't they? They When they sent spies in, to France, they had to make sure all the clothes were bang on correct. Right, right. I love there was a section too, like how to look like a sick homeless person, right? This is like fast for as long as you can and rub dirt on your face and, and do that. Yeah, I think even apply burns to your skin and right. don't cut your nails. Yeah, and I think it, and as well put things in your mouth and make yourself look as disgusting and as horrible as possible because everybody ignores beggars, don't they? Right, right, right. Yeah, they just ignore you. And besides the clothing, what kind of equipment was sort of standard operating procedure for ninja so was it the katana like the sword was that a thing or was that 
Is that a myth? Well, the ninja sword itself doesn't exist. They just used normal swords, which was fine. But uh, in the show Ninky, it says go with a short sword in. However, the best one, to be honest, is um, that we've now translated about 10 different books on ninjas and a, a load of ninja manuals. Show Ninky is just one of them. but uh, And it has the least amount of tools in it, believe it or not. Uh, the other one we've done is the book of ninja has loads of tools. And for example, climbing ladders, collapsible grappling hooks, um, floats to get you across water, all that type of thing. So if you need to climb, you need to get across a moat in a castle. So something like a lifeboat, a uh, life boy needs to float you across, then spikes to climb up the wall, then a grappling hook to get over the last bit of the wall. And then maybe uh, some hand grenades are used, things like that. Yeah, that's crazy. And so you mentioned earlier that there were two ways. So ninjas were basically spies. There was two ways you could get reconnaissance. You could infiltrate and that was done at night or in other ways clandestinely. But I thought it was interesting. You, the other way was just be out in the open, but be, disguise yourself. And it seems like most of the book was dedicated to how to do recover reconnaissance in that more open way. Yes, this is one of the problems we're having the show in Inky. It's, to be honest, my favorite ninja manual of all time. But now we've been digging into it, it turns out it's only one of 30 manuals overall. But three of those 30 are ninja manuals. So it's like a peek into the ninja, but it assumes you've read the other 29 scrolls from Samurai Warfare, you know, from every aspect. So some bits do seem missing. So in this one, it's more about how to, because Natori Masazumi is born in a time of peace just after the wars. So, and he served one of the most powerful families in Japan, and he would probably go around checking for rebellions, checking if anybody's causing any troubles. What I loved about this book is that it provides even though it was written in the 1600s, it was written for ninjas, there are these great insights that just common people living in the West in the 21st century can apply themselves, particularly on how to interact with people in order to gain information from them, because that's a useful thing to have in business or even in just your personal life, you know, if you're dating someone. So what can we learn from ninjas about interacting with people to get information that we might want from them? Right. Basically, ninjas did deal with psychology, and they tried to investigate their version of psychology and it says that the human mind is divided into two main aspects you've got the mind of man and the mind or the principles of heaven and the idea here is that basically there's what's right and what's wrong and normally people will try their best to to get what benefits them you've got to realize that most people most of the time are l not lying but being mistruthful so a ninja's job is to try and get through to what the truth is in the mind. So what happens is when you study ninjutsu, you end up finding, you're realizing when people are lying, you end up realizing when people are exaggerating, and you start to be able to go beyond what they're saying and construct a big picture of what's happening in the background just through their vocabulary, their words they use, and also their body language, things like that. Right, there's a lot of uh, sections dedicated to how to read body language. Yes, that's one of the bits that's a little bit out of date because he's using an old Chinese, almost mystical method. But yeah, absolutely, ninjutsu is very much about... Because you've got to remember that the enemy are trying to hide what they want to do from enemy spies and they don't know who the spies are so this is where we go back to the question that these ninja were walking around in normal clothes getting information because they were you know inside of the enemy province so bit by bit they have to reconstruct from what people say and what people are doing right and, and i love too there was a bit in there about just understanding people's psychology and like the best places to go for information for example they said in the time of the ninja the best place to go to get information oftentimes was the temple amongst priests what what was it about the the temple that made it such a great place to get information about your enemy most people uh, had to be registered at a temple at, more, at some points in japan and the temple it's like the church in probably the early 20th century everybody went to the church and had a chat all information was being done there and it actually says in the scrolls it says don't bribe lower level people with gold because they'll be become a bit wary that's too much yet if you offer gold to priests they love it they will lap up as much money as possible and they are the ones in the know they they know what's going on in the community all right so a bit of cynicism there from this guy <laughs> oh, absolutely <laughs> there's actually a quote from an englishman the first englishman who got to uh, japan was in the 1600s and he said that the monks just run down on a, on their day off and get as much silk as they can and posh food and <laughs> nothing's changed <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, I, I thought another interesting bit of uh, psychology that the ninja used, there's this interesting section called how to avoid defeating people. Why have a chapter on how not to defeat your enemy if that's what the whole point of ninjutsu was, to get reconnaissance to defeat your enemy? Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. That's a common misconception. You don't want to defeat the enemy, meaning the, the enemy spy or the person you're inter- uh, sort of interviewing, if you like. You don't want to defeat them because they'll close up. The idea behind this is when you're in a conversation, you need to create an argument. A ninja would create an argument and they would say something that was clearly wrong. And the, uh, the enemy spy or the person they're talking to would correct them and they would have to admit defeat. But through correcting them, they give away loads of information. So this is the difference between losing the points battle, but winning the war. So you've got to lose lots of little battles so you can gain information. And then eventually you put all that information together and move in and get them. Because most people will not want to lose an argument. That's one of the skills of the ninja. You have to end up looking stupid and losing so people will be get carried away and say too much. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting point. Uh, the, the the guy repeatedly throughout the book is like, look dumber than you actually are. I mean, that was, and, when it's, and it's amazing. It's, it's an effective strategy. I mean, I've read books where leaders in the modern day have taken that approach. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower here in the United States, he was a really sharp guy, but he, he often played as himself sort of this rube from Kansas who, just a country boy, by taking on that persona, he was able to get more information from people than he otherwise would have. It's absolutely. They even say you should pick people who visually look stupid as well. So it's people who you just automatically think, oh, he looks stupid, but yet they're clever underneath and they play the role of the idiot and they go out, as you say, as beggars looking stupid, but inside they've got phenomenal minds just working overtime in multiple different dialects on multiple levels and they're just collecting information by memory as well. And so the idea is that you've got that this front of a, a really stupid silly person but in the background you've got to work excellent right so there was also sections where the ninja were were told to find lessons from animals i think this this is a very common thing in ancient asian cultures like learn lessons from the dog or for from the cat or something like that um what were some of these lessons that we find in the, the shinoki about how ninja can learn from nature and how to approach their work so he in the in the manual he divides it into two here what he says is from four-legged animals by that he means cattle really you know um domestic cattle and by wolves and raccoons and this has got something to do with the traditions in japan in japan a wolf um or sorry a fox a wolf and a raccoon they have magical powers sometimes and they um can disguise and mutate themselves so what he's saying here is if you follow the path of the wolf the fox you use disguise deception you go deep into the mountains you'll go clandestine at night and use all that attitude but if you use like the cattle it means let people lead you where you want to go another ninja master called chikamatsu he basically said that most ninjas will automatically try to go and climb over the gate or do this but he said instead why don't you just get a job as a servant to someone who's allowed in that castle. And if you remember, these guys are mainly samurai, so they have to really, really lower their sort of standards, become a servant to someone who'll probably hit them and hate them. And then what happens is when they go through the castle gates, they're allowed in. They automatically infiltrate without having to risk their lives. So that's the idea you divide. One is wolves, like climb over, get in deception. And the other one is just go in with someone who's meant to be there. Be followed, be a cattle and be led in. Right. I think, you know, applying that to our own... Cells. I mean, I think the tendency for us in our sort of hyper competitive world is we want to be the wolf, right? Just like be confrontational, just get right in there. Um, but the the better way is to be a cow. Absolutely, get, yeah. get led to where you want to be. Yeah, it's less it's less risky, isn't it? This way, chaps. Okay, thanks. Right, right. But yeah, I mean, it, and it's hard though because you don't want to be put in that subservient role. But sometimes you need to do that. Going back to that idea, looking dumber than you really are it might hurt your pride a little bit. But uh, you have to look at the long game. That's exactly back to the same issue with that not to defeat others. If you defeat them, they close up, they stop talking. You know, if you suddenly have a go at someone and you're clearly more intelligent than they are, they'll make an excuse to leave or they'll stop talking. Whereas if you look more stupid than they are, they will just love it and go for it. Right. And there were some sections too about teamwork. I guess ideally, like, but I found that the, the author was a little bit ambivalent about ninja teams. Got the idea that if you had a really good ninja with you working it was better but if you had a bad one a bad partner like it made things worse for you so what insights can we learn about teamwork or working with other people 
from ninjas. Right. So in the in the teamwork area, the problem is is if you're infiltrating at night and you're moving into say an enemy house, this is basically what he's talking about. You need a watchman. You need an infiltrator who creeps deep into the enemy, and you also need people. They'll get ready with swords next to the doors for when everybody starts running out. They'll start cutting them down. Um, so what happened was if you have to work as a unit. Absolutely. So practice, practice, practice. Because if you don't, one of you messes up, everybody wakes up, starts drawing their weapons, and it becomes a bit of a bloodbath, really, and they don't want that. And especially when you're going in open disguise, if someone's not good enough, they're not speaking well enough, or they're just not working right, it'll give up the entire team. So that was a problem. So he his point there is, if you can do it alone, it's better. But if you have to do it in a team, you must be really gelled together and like each other as well. We've talked sort of the big picture, kind of the more, the tactics that uh, allow you to get information in a more open way. But let's talk about some of the clandestine things. Those are fun. That's like the things we think about when we think ninja. So what were some of the tactics ninja used to infiltrate a palace or a building to get information? In there, well, this one we book talks about using sickness. So what you do is you walk up, you'll knock on a door and you'll be like vomiting or make yourself vomit or look really ill. And you say, I'm so sorry. But what you don't do is you don't push your way in. You just say, I just need some water. That's fine. And you take the water and you take refreshment and then you go on your way. Then what you do is you'll case the joint for around for a few days, but then you pretend you've been on your journey. You come back with some presents and you go in and say, thank you for looking after me. I feel better now. Here are the gifts. And then what you do is you map out the internals of the house and you map it by memory. And if you get chance, you open the locks to the windows and things like that. And then what, when you say goodbye, thank you very much, goodbye, later on that night when everyone's gone to sleep, you'll use the window that you've opened and creep through and then crack on and do what you need to do. Wow. There were sections about roof walking. That's how we get kind of a stereotype we have of ninjas, like they're out in the night walking the tiled roofs, but that actually happened. That was a thing. Oh yeah, without doubt. Don't get me wrong. What, what we need to do is change the image of the ninja. It is how we imagine it, but it's a little bit different. It's not, it's more sophisticated and there's two parts. So as I said before, there's the part where you go and open disguise and then there's like climbing on roofs. And so it says you have to walk along the ridge so that all the beams so to make sure that you don't make a squeaking noise as you go along. Or if somebody looks up at you, you throw a stone down one side and jump down the other and people will hear the stone and then follow that way as you jump over the fences and move out. There was also too like on how to walk when you're in a house because I guess the, they, there's a diagram in there how um, the mats were arranged in the floor in homes of Japan and like I guess it'll the way if you walked on it normally it would make a lot of noise but if you walked on it in a certain way it didn't make as much noise did I read that right yeah you did that's actually though that's an addition from another school that's in the back of the book that's uh, from a school called Katori Shinto Ryu but absolutely yeah that's there it's uh, not from the manual that's a secret tradition that's passed down by one of the oldest schools in Japan but yep ninjas absolutely talk about how to walk in so for example if you're in a marsh you have to pull your toes up very directly up because it otherwise if you just push forward you do that squelching sound and then if you're in corridors you have to go along the inside of the corridor and slide your feet gently as so if you're in the middle because if you're in the middle you will um spring on the boards and you'll make creaking sounds and there's even one which we don't really know how realistic is but where you put your hands on the floor and you put your heart your feet on top of your hands and use your hands like almost like a crouch frog type movement that sounds really uncomfortable it does. It does sound uncomfortable, but it's appeared in two separate manuals now, which means and uh, from different times. So they must have been doing something. And I've had a professional dancer test it and they did it really quite well, actually. Also, another thing was to avoid water. That was the one thing I saw is like avoid water at all costs. But if you do like tread with caution. Yeah, pretty much. One of the old techniques they used to use was uh, they'd clip the wings of um, some waterfowl and they'd put that on the moat or on, you know, the water outside a house. And when somebody came in, it'd try and fly away, but it'd make a splashing noise because it couldn't fly away. And always water gives away your position. Yeah. So they use that as a distraction technique. Yeah. There's also great tidbits in there about how to distract your enemy. So they'll go one way. Like, so if you're on a roof, you throw a rock on the other side of the roof. So they'd go check that out while you were getting out the other way. Yeah, absolutely. And an, another manual states that if you set up Chinese firecrackers, so when you, uh, when you leave, if somebody sees you, you can set fire to the f firecrackers and it sounds like muskets are being shot at them. So they will stop and start firing back while the ninja runs off in another direction. 
Oh, and another cool tidbit that I thought was really neat was on how to do reconnaissance, how to count people. Like they would have this elaborate system. It wasn't actually an elaborate system of bags. It's just like you get these bags with different colored rocks and you would transfer them in as you were counting. And at the end, you can just look at the bag and see automatically how many people were in that building you were at. Yeah, so there's two skills here. There's one where if you need to know how many buildings are in a town, so if you need to know how many sort of houses are in a town, you can get the population number. And what you do is you put uh, in your sleeve, they have long sleeves in Japan. So you'd put beans, yeah, and you drop one. And you know if there's 100 beans in your sleeve, if you're only left with five, there's 95 houses. And then similar, when you're counting people, you would have like, say, 10 bags, one bag for mounted horsemen, one bag for, you know, gunners. And you just, yeah, pick out the beans. So you don't have to actually count, just pick the beans out and then count them up at the end. Yeah, it's really clever. I thought that was pretty cool. It's really, yeah, really easy and really clever. (laughs) So let's talk about something I had no idea that existed, but was uh, ninjutsu magic or witchcraft. Can you talk a bit about that? Like what what did they believe that this magic could do for them? What were some of the spells or talismans that they used to perform this magic? Obviously, it's a medieval society, so magic is throughout. Um, Natori Masazumi himself says, don't trust magic too much. It's a little bit dark and seedy, but he also says, don't throw it away. But for example, in the Shonen Ki, it has spells of protection. So the idea is that when you go on a mission, you'll fast for seven days, you'll write out these spells, you'll put them, and sometimes they consume them by eating the paper. And the idea is that, you know, the enemies won't see you or capture you. But other manuals go really quite dark, to be honest. There's ones where they actually take out the eyes of dogs, living dogs, and they'll grind them up and they'll paste them on their foreheads or eye around their eyes. And the idea is that you can see better in the dark or that the enemy won't see you. So invisibility spells, things like that, protection spells or uh, curses for the enemy so you can curse them. Like, for example, one of these schools, which is a bit crazy, goes into infiltrating people's dreams. So ninjas will cast these spells and send dreams to the enemy that will make the enemy really upset the next day for battle that's crazy it is crazy isn't it <laughs> and, the, and there are some of the, the the spells in the in the scrolls you all translated um so if you want to check that out and you're listening uh, you can get a, pick up a copy of the book it's it's pretty interesting the end of the book it's not part of the scrolls as you said earlier i, I referenced something that wasn't in the scrolls but it was this sort of oral tradition of how to defeat a ninja can you talk a little bit about that? Who, who, where did that come from, and what were some of the insights on how to defeat ninjas? Do you mean the entire system at the end? Yeah, the entire system. So basically, this school had been around for about 500 years. It's called Katori Shintori, and they had a ninja tradition, but the idea is to defeat ninja. They themselves said you should never become a ninja because it was a, a pretty horrible job to do. And the idea is that you would set up as many defenses as possible to stop shinobi infiltrating to stop them getting in so for example in that book they in that oral tradition they have a certain smell of burnt powder because a ninja will move forward and he'll throw this powder in the air and what happens is that that floating almost light dust will hide the um, outline of a ninja so if you're in the dark the human eye can automatically see what looks like an outline even when it's a tree you think is that a man you know because it sees the shape of a human so what they do is they try to hide the shapes. So it's just skills like that, basically. Gotcha. And so we, we mentioned earlier that like ninja martial arts does not exist. But I mean, are there individuals where this idea of ninjutsu has still been passed on and like it's still practiced as a philosophy? I don't know if it's a philosophy would be a right word, but is it still exist in some form today? That is uh, the big, that's the emotional question i think that's out there there's a big ninja community out there and they obviously some of them practice hand-to-hand combat and some of them don't but i would say and my honest opinion is and i've searched for these there is no it's all died out there are now three japanese people around three japanese people who claim to be the last ninja but none of them have any proof whatsoever all of their stories only go back to like the 1960s, 1970s, and they don't really fit history. It's a little bit strange, to be honest. Yeah, it is. Like going back to sort of the um, the idea of ninja, the history of it, was the skill of ninjutsu, was this something that was passed on from, say, father to son, or was it something that you were just trained to do? Like you were brought into like spy school, ninja school, and you were taught how to be a ninja if that was your you were called to do that. Yeah, basically a different version. So you know that one we just talked about where it was the uh, how to defeat a ninja tradition. 
So that's only a very small amount in a samurai sword school. So from one end, the smallest end, they've got these like how to defeat a ninja or how to stop them coming after you. Uh, just passed on and right at the other end uh, sorry right at the other end you have full-on schools and these are places called Iga and Koka they're different cities or towns if you like areas in Japan and those guys were brought up in their samurai families and their speciality was ninjutsu they were only passed on from like you know within the family so from at one end you get highly specialized ninja uh, right to the other end where little tidbits are passed on in schools also, in, in this one, the Shoninki here, it's basically he has picked the best people. So this guy, Natori Masazumi, was teaching in a place called Kishu. And when um, he got samurai students come in, those who were really good or they suited ninjutsu, he would teach them ninjutsu as time went on. So we've learned a lot. I think a lot of people's childhood illusions or dreams were shattered in this podcast <laughs> destroyed <laughs> however though guys i would like to say if you're listening honestly i was one of those guys i was like childhood that's what ninjas do but even though it's difficult this historical ninjutsu is difficult to understand it's far better than the fantasy by a long shot so you've spent years researching ninja and ninjutsu all this research that you've done what are some like lessons that you think we can take from the ninja, the life of the ninja, that we can apply to our own lives, even if we're not clandestine spies, we're just average Joes making our way through 21st century uh, Western world here. What are some lessons that guys today can apply from their lives from the ninja? The thing about historical ninjutsu, obviously you can't do it for real because it's highly illegal. That just wouldn't do. But what I found studying this is it reshapes your mind. When you start at the beginning of samurai training and you go all the way through to the ninja training, you start to think differently. You start to look at the world differently. Different things become you know, more important, different things go off the other side. So I would say the number one thing people can take from ninjutsu is how to reconstruct the way you think and how you reapproach the world. Absolutely. I think once you've done the train or once you go through it, you come out with a much more structured mental attitude. Definitely. I love that. Well, Anthony, where can people learn more about the book and your other work? Right. If I could say to everyone, basically, if you want to go to my website, you can use www.natori.co.uk, which is N-A-T-O-R-I, and just click Anthony Cummins and you'll see there. But what I would say, guys, is I've been working now for 10 years and I've been going backwards and forwards to Japan and I'm trying to reconstruct what we understand about the samurai and the ninja. So if possible, uh, of course, you can just go onto Amazon and type in True Path of the Ninja. And I'd recommend, guys, you get the red paperback because it's the most up-to-date version but if, if if you find that interesting then i would say if you want to start at the beginning go to a book called the book of samurai it is the first work natori masazumi writes and we're publishing that from volume one all the way to volume 10 and the show ninki will be republished in it for those guys who just are brand new at all ninjas brand new at everything i would definitely, definitely recommend a book called Samurai and Ninja by Anthony Cummins. I just say that because there's lots of different books out there with similar titles. That will give the absolute beginner the full lot. And uh, lastly, if you're absolutely obsessed with ninjas, I would say uh, go for a book called The Book of Ninja or another book called Eager and Coca Ninja Skills. With that, guys, you can learn everything you know. I would be grateful if you guys could help out because we're a self-funded team. And the only way we get money is through book sales. So thank you very much for the, obviously, opportunity through this podcast. Anthony Cummins, thank you so much your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. My guest today was Anthony Cummins. He helped translate the book, The True Path of the Ninja. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also find more information about Anthony's work at AnthonyCummins.com. That's A-N-T-O-N-Y-C-U-M-M-I-N-S.com. And you can find more information about his other books he's uh, published. Check out his books about the samurai. Really fascinating as well. And also make sure to check out our show notes at aom.is ninjas where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper in this topic.